changing it up on y'all today, giving y'all two different verses. Y'all would go ahead and stand. We're going to read Jeremiah 29, 11 first. Jeremiah 29, 11. Everybody stay there, say amen. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now everybody flip over to Romans chapter 4. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for the singing this morning. Lord, we just ask that you would fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you this morning. Lord, you say you have prepared us and you have created us for great and mighty things. And Lord, we're clinging to that hope this morning. Lord, move this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hold your place there in Romans chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at this morning. In Romans chapter 4, if you will, read with me from verses 18 all the way down to 21 right there. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Right here, as we pick up in Romans, Abraham was promised a seed. He was promised a child. So by God, God had told him, I'm going to give you this child. Abraham was 100 years old, actually 90 years old when God came to him. Maybe even a little younger than that. He was old, way too old to be having kids, amen? Matter of fact, I told y'all this the other day. I'm 36 years old. And I was playing with little baby Charlotte the other day. And somebody said, don't you want another one? No, I don't. I'm good. <laughs> Three strikes, you're out. We're good, right? And you know, it's all that we can do to chase little Evie around right now. She's two. And thank the Lord for Emma and Ian. At times it can help us corral them. But I can't imagine being 90, 100 years old chasing a one or two year old. Amen? Amen? Well, God had come to Abraham and he had said, I'm going to give you and your wife a child at 100 years old and 90 years old. Now, here's the thing. The message this morning is not about this child. <coughs> the message this morning is about hope. Having hope. How many times in life have you ever met someone that has lost their hope? Amen. How many of you have ever lost your hope? Amen. Many of us. Let me tell you, if you've ever played sports at times in your life, you lose hope in the situation. Many times in life where you're playing the sport and you're just getting beat down. You're like, I might as well quit. It ain't worth it no more. Right? And then uh, many of us have these favorite ball teams. Just like me. I'm going to pick on them. And, and they let me down. Georgia last year the that's championship game. I had hope we were finally going to do it. Right? For the first time ever. They need to get saved. Whoever said that. <laughs> for the first time in my life, Georgia's playing for the national championship. And I had hope all day long. I'm decked out in red and black. Decked out in hope. That they're gonna finally do it! And they did. <laughs> they did. They did. This is destroyed by But many of us in our life need hope. We cling to hope. That's why we roll out of the bed. It's hoping <laughs> it's 
going to be a great day. Hoping everything today is going to go smooth. Matter of fact, sometimes we might roll out of that bed and we might move kind of slow, hoping that we can control a lot of the things before they happen. Hoping it will be a great day. We put hope in our jobs. We put hope in people. We put hope in so many things of this world. You say, I don't put hope in my job. Yes, you do. You finance a house for 30 years. Hoping that you're going to have a job for the next 30 years. Amen? Yes, we put hope in our jobs. We hope. Come Friday, we get a paycheck. Right? Matter of fact, I get paid every Wednesday. And I, I hope Miss Louise is here with that check. Amen? <laughs> we hope. But so many times in our life, our hope is destroyed. Let me give you the true definition of hope. A feeling of expectation, a desire for a certain thing to happen. And then the second definition for hope, a feeling of trust. A feeling of trust. We trust that situation that is going to happen. And it excites us. And it gives us reason to get moving when we don't normally want to move. Y'all can ask Amy. Last year when Georgia was getting ready to play in that next championship game. I was just all pumped up. I was just all decked out. I was just in a totally different mood than normal, right? Because I had this different kind of hope. Like I've never had before. And that's what life situations will do to you so many times. It will make you change your daily routine. You will dress different. You will talk different. You'll be happy. You know what? I probably didn't have a one red cent that day. I didn't care. I probably didn't have. No, and the weather wasn't good. I remember it was cold. I didn't care. I didn't get to go play golf or hunt or nothing like that. I didn't care. I was happy, right? I had hope in something else that day. And that's what we'll do with our lives so many times. We'll store up all this hope in something, but then when we don't get it, it destroys us. It lets us down. Amy wouldn't even talk to me the next day, y'all. <laughs> she stayed away from me. I was in a state of depression. <laughs> I still am. <laughs> but that's what happens to us. We let these situations in life build us up just to let us down. And Abraham right here, even at his age, even like it says right there, look at verse 18 of chapter 4 again, Romans. Romans chapter 4, 18. Who against hope? Who against hope? If you would have talked to anybody in the world, and they would have and said, you know what? God promised me a child. Well, Abraham, <laughs> have you forgotten how many birthdays you've had, son? Have you forgotten how many birthdays Sarah's had? Brother, you just don't have kids at 190 years old. It just don't happen. So you know what? Against all hope, if he would have asked his family, if he would have asked friends, if he would have asked anybody, or if he would have told anybody, I'm going to have a child, y'all. Woo! -hoo, I'm going to have a baby. They're going to be like, maybe you're nephew or your niece or somebody's going to have a child. I doubt it's going to be you, Abraham. You see, it was against hope. It did not make sense what Abraham was believing in to us. You know, the, the, the God don't think the same way we think. God can do things that we can't do. Now look what also it says in that same verse. Who against hope believed in hope. Now look on down right there at verse 20. <laughs> he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong 
in faith. You know, that's where we are today. Many of us have lost that strength in faith. You know why? Because you can't have faith without hope. Did y'all get that this morning? You cannot have faith without hope. If you don't believe in something, if you believe something is not there, it don't exist, then you will never have faith in something. Amen. If you, there's no hope that that thing even exists, you can't have faith in it. I have faith that when I get in my truck, it's going to crank up and take me where I want to go. Right? But if I don't even have a truck, if I'm hoping for a truck, if I hope... <coughs> I hope that, that doesn't even make sense sometimes. We need hope to have faith. And you see right here, he had hope even when nobody else believed in hope. Then made his faith stronger. You know, many of us would have doubted if God come to us. If God went to somebody in the nursing home and said, you're going to have a child. Everybody in the nursing home, everybody else would have said, you're crazy. We give you some more medicine, right? That's what it sounds like right here. Many times in our lives when God says, you're going to do something. I'm going to give you this. I've got this prepared for you. Our friends and our family think we're a little crazy. They say, what has happened to me? What has happened? But what did Jeremiah 29, 11 say again? Listen to it real good. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. This is God speaking. Saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God has a plan for your life. He has an expected end for you. And when you realize what that end is, when you start believing in what that end is, then you will have that strong faith. You see, we're not hoping, putting our hope in God anymore. We're putting our hope in the things of this world. That's why we're let down so many times in life. When we put our faith and our hope in people and material items, they will let you down. I told every single one of y'all, I love you with all my heart, but I don't trust you no further than I can throw you. And I mean that out of love. You know why? Because if, if I put all my faith and my trust in you, I, you're going to let me down. If you put all your faith and your trust in me, I'm going to let you down. I'm not God. And neither is anybody in here. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We put our faith and our trust in people, we will be let down. We will have our hearts ripped out of our chest. God showed me, and as in my 20s, that I need to put all my faith and my trust in Him because He has never let me down. Nor will He ever. But when the times are, are stacked up against us, and we start turning to friends and to family, we store up all of our hope and the things of this world, we get let down. Amen. I want you to in 2001, the Duke Blue Devils was playing in the final four. They were down by 22 points in the first half. And probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, college coaches of all time, Mike Shazeski. Mike Shazeski takes them in back there in the locker room at the end. And he says, Guys, you can't play no worse. You're losing. You're losing so bad. You might as well just have fun. And go out there and play. Guess what? They come back and the They come back 
and won in that game. Now I say that to say this. Most teams, most times in life, when you get that far behind, you throw up your hands, it ain't worth it no more. It don't matter anymore. I don't care anymore. You've lost hope that you are going to win this game, that you're going to win this situation. And you're just like, I don't care anymore. It's over. I know it's over. I'm just waiting on the buzzer. I'm just waiting on whatever this situation is to end. It's over. You know what? If, if many times teams show up at a ball game and they say, there's no chance we can win. Well, guess what? With that attitude, you'll never win. Several years ago, Appalachian State, a little bitty college, might as well be like a high school, goes up to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and beats one of the most prized colleges, football traditions of all time, Michigan. Beat them. But if Appalachian State would have walked in there, they would have said, there's no chance we can win, guys. There's no way we'll ever beat Michigan. Guess what? They might as well not even have showed up. Their hope was gone before they ever showed up. And when somebody says, I've got this job for you. I've got this position for you. I've got this role for you. You're like, I can't do that. God would never allow me to do something like that. God would never allow me to be that. You're defeated before you ever even started. You never even give it a chance in life. You have, or or you get in there and times get a little tough. You know that's what happens with a lot of Christians. They say, "Oh, I'm saved now. Everything's just going to be wonderful." And guess what? They follow hard times and they say, "Well, this ain't what I expected it to be." And they lose hope in Christianity, and they you never see them again. We give up. When we fall on these hard times, we lose hope in the situations. Everybody flip over with me. Mark chapter um, 5. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you a verse. Mark chapter 5. Turn, this is Zechariah 9 12. Turn you to be strong, hope. You prisoners of hope, even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. While everybody's turning there in Mark chapter 5, I want to tell you what this verse right here, Zechariah said. He said, you prisoners of hope. He said, Zechariah said right here, surround yourselves with hope in God. Why would I want to do that? I'll tell you why you want to do that. Because when Satan comes at you, when the life situations come at you, when times are tough and you're surrounded by hope, knowing that God can pull me through this no matter what, guess what? You start believing in every situation. Just like those new blue devils that day, they didn't they, anybody else say, I'm defeated. There's no way I can win. But they had surrounded themselves with hope. They said, guys, there's 15 more minutes out here. 15 minutes a lot can happen. I have hope we can do this. And they went out there and they did it. You know, it ain't, the, we don't remember the games where people just blew people out. We remember games when there was no chance someone could win in that situation. And they did we remember the times in history and in life when people said, it is finished, you might as well quit. And there was something inside you that said, no, as long as there's breath in these lungs, there's hope because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And they did not stop. And they made the ultimate comeback in war. This right here, Mark chapter 5. I want you to see what's happening right here. Mark chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus had gotten a, a call. He got off the ship and a man by the name of Jairus had come and got Jesus. 
And he says, I need you to go with me, for my daughter is sick. And as Jesus is walking, these great multitudes are following Jesus everywhere he goes. And Jesus is walking along, and people are yanking and pulling on him because they've heard about his miracles. They've seen him. But here's what I want y'all to see this morning. Mark 5, 24. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged on him. They were pulling on him from every angle. Verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many positions, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Do you hear what's happening right here in this situation? This woman has an issue of her blood. She has went to the greatest doctors in the land. And she has done everything in her power to get to these people and say, there's a problem, I need your help. The greatest physicians in the land. And they couldn't do nothing. Then she spends every dime she has for healing. And guess what? Nothing. Matter of fact, it says right there at the end of verse 26, nothing was better, but rather it grew worse. And guess what happens right here in most people's lives? They throw in the towel. They quit. I'm done. I have done everything I know to do. I have spent every last dime on that rope. I have been to the greatest doctors in the world. There is no hope. The doctors probably told her, man, we're sorry. You're one of the rarest cases we've ever seen. There's nothing we can do. We've tried everything. Ma'am, you may have four to six months. We don't know. We're sorry. Well, guess what? At a time of today, if a doctor tells you he's sorry, we're done, right? There's no hope, right? It is finished. And so what do we do a lot of times? We just shrivel up. We, don't, we throw in the time. We say, we don't care anymore. We're done. In four to six months, it won't matter anymore anyway. And we quit. And we give up all hope. Where we probably used to want to keep our house spotless. All of a sudden, a dish falls, gets dirty. I don't care. In six months, they my problem anymore anyway. Right? Cars filthy, need service. Well, I don't care. Four months, I won't be somebody else's problem. That'd be somebody else's problem. When they quit. Somebody that used to be so organized, so prepared, so ready to go in life, all of a sudden just said, four to six months, I'm out of here, guys. That's y'all's problem. Grass is knee deep. I don't care anymore. They change who they are. Why? Because they don't have hope anymore. They do not believe they will be here the next day. They don't believe they'll ever be here again. I want to give y'all a story of this young man. Young 19, 20 year old guy. Had a motorcycle. Loved riding motorcycles. Rode them fast everywhere he went. One day though, this particular case, he's doing right. Riding along. Cruising along. And a young girl, 16 years old, runs a red light. Pulls out in front of him and hits him. You know? He hits the front of the, the car. As he's flying over the hood, his knee hits the headlight shatters his knee. He lands on his shoulder, tears the nerve in his shoulder. <clears throat> he says, I was a pitcher. I could throw in the high 90s. I'm doing it. Life was great. Had a motorcycle, young, strong. I, everything in life was great. And he says, next thing I know, I wake up in the hospital and I'm all, I got my arm up in this thing. My knee's just destroyed from all the, the, the damage. I'm laying there at 20 years old thinking my life is over. My life has changed forever. He's laying there. He finally gets out of the hospital. He has trouble walking. 
walking because of this wreck. His arm is just hanging there now. It's like a noodle. He can never use it again. He can never move it again. It's just dangling there. And he is eating pain pills like candy because he's in so much pain and misery. And he says, I was at the lowest part of my life at 21, 22 years old. I had never been lower than I had in my life before. And he says, I, I went and found a 38 revolver. Had hollow points in it. Had it stuck to my cheek. Fixing to pull the trigger. I had lost all hope. I didn't care anymore. I couldn't live like this anymore. It was too much. And he said his mama called him before he pulled the trigger. The next few days later, he got the gun again, had it to his face again. Mama found him again as he's getting ready to do it. And he said, then all of a sudden, the strangest thing happened. He said, my brother, who I hadn't seen in forever, showed up. He had been gone out of town working. And he said, he walks in. He says, I just want to see Daniel. His brother. And he goes in there and he sees Daniel laying there in Daniel's vision. And he's just so happy to see his brother. And he hugs him. And he starts loving on him. And he says, brother, I just want you to know something. I've been in church. I believe in Jesus Christ now. And I've been praying for you. He says, brother, don't give up. God's got a plan for you. I've been praying for you, brother. And he said that day, his brother planted a seed inside of him. And then all of a sudden, God started watering this seed inside of him. And he said, now I feel like I am a full grown tree. He said, God changed my life. God gave me hope again. He said, I was at the lowest part of my life. He said, but I'm so much better now. He said, now I'll never get to use my arm. My knee will always be destroyed. He said, but I am better right now than I ever was before I got on that motorcycle that day. Because I have the love of Jesus Christ inside of me. Amen. He said, he said, let me give you this. He said, this is my favorite thing to tell people. He said, God gives you the strength to overcome what is overcoming us. Amen. God gives us the strength to overcome what is overcoming us. You see, they, this young man had no hope. The doctors couldn't do anything else for him. His family couldn't do nothing for him. All the money in the world couldn't do nothing for him. But then, his brother told him about Jesus. That's right. You know, this, part, this story right here in Mark, don't mean. Look at the next verse. Verse 27. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in and pressed behind and touched His garment. For she said, if, if I may but touch His clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now here's the kind of part that's kind of funny. Jesus is walking along. We read right there in verse 24. A lot of people are yanking on Him. A lot of people are pulling on Him. A lot of people want to touch Him. But the thing that was so different, this woman had put all her hope in one more thing. She had put it in doctors and failed. She had put it in the money to pay these people and failed. She was down to her last hope. And she said, after all these people are yanking and pulling and throwing on him, as the Bible says, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, here's the part I love about this. First off, all the disciples are standing there. We're going to read it here in the next verse. 
Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, Lord, everybody's touching you. What do you mean, who touched you? And he says, no, somebody touched me. And guess what? All those people are around. He has to get to another young girl that's about to die. He has to get to another deadly situation. And all these other people are pulling on Jesus. And Jesus stops everything. And he says, who touched me? Let's read on. Verse 31, And the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging on thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And, said unto, and he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. She was scared to death. Jesus said, Who touched me? She knew what she had done. But here's the best part. Jesus stopped the whole world around him to focus on one person. Can you imagine being Jairus' daughter, Jairus, the father right here, saying, Lord, I know people are yanking on you and pulling on you, but my daughter's still sick down the road. We got to go, right? We're a little bit on a time schedule, Lord. Can you imagine all those other people that, I touched you, why didn't I get something too? But here's the difference. She believed in faith. She had hope. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I want you to know something this morning. You either know somebody that don't have hope anymore, they have lost all their hope, they have put their hope in things, and it's gone. They are wanting to commit suicide. You know, up there in Atlanta where I used to work, they, used, they had to put fences on every bridge up there because of the suiciders jumping off the bridges committing suicide. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in California, they've had to put nets under the bridge because the people are committing suicide so badly jumping off of that bridge. People, every single day, I've had phone calls in the last few weeks of people that have committed suicide because they have lost all hope. That young man Daniel would have committed suicide if his mother would not have caught him because he had lost all hope. People are losing hope every single day. But I want you to know something. There's a man by the name of Jesus that wants to, you to reach out to him and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I put my faith and my trust in too many things of this world. And I need you, Lord. And you need your hope restored. You need God and Jesus to take your life and turn it around so that you can see what He has touched you and made you for. That same man, Daniel, said, The thing that I love the most about giving my life to Christ is that I now know what I was created for. His, very, his words were saying, I now have identity. <clears throat> I know who I was created to be. Do you know who you were created to be this morning? Have you surrounded yourself with the hope of Jesus Christ and the fact you said, Lord, I put all my faith and my trust in You no matter what happens, Lord, I know you got a bigger, better plan. There was a lady that was in here not long ago that said she was about to lose her job. And where most people would have been tore up, she said, John, she said, God's took care of me my whole life. I ain't never missed a meal. I've always had clothes. I've always had a home. She said, they are saying we ain't going to have a job. But you know what? God's led me this far. Guess what? I talked to her the other day. They're about to buy a house. Work's great. Life's great. Where God guides, 
God provides. And if God has given you an identity this morning, if He's given you a purpose in life, follow Him. Take all your faith and your hope and store it up in Him. I love what Abraham said right there. Everybody flip this morning as we close back over the promise. <coughs> Romans chapter 5, and then we're going to flip over to verse 15 to close it, or chapter 15 to close it. Down. Romans chapter 5, Abraham says right there in verse 21. Or, or Paul says about Abraham. And being, ver being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Do you believe that God can do what He says He wants to do? Do you believe that the same God that just said, let there be an earth, there was an earth. Let there be a universe, there was a universe. Let there be light, there was a light. Let there be water. Do you believe that God, when you, when God shows you where He wants you to be in life, when God shows you His master plan in your life, He is fully capable of doing it. But you know, you sometimes, the only way to do that, and the only way to be like that, is we have to give our life totally to God. Just like that young man. You see, that man thought I had everything in line, everything was going so smooth, and so great. And if you would have told him before the break, hey look, in a few days you're never going to walk again, your arm's going to be like a noodle, but you're going to be happier than you've ever been in your life. You know what? He probably would have chose Jesus before the wreck instead of having to get Jesus to get him to that point to get him after. You see, God has a plan for your life. And He wants to do these mighty great things. You know, people say that when I get saved, times get tougher, life gets harder. But you know, the Bible teaches that when we get saved, we will have everlasting life. And don't say it. You'll have a miserable life while you're here on earth. But when you get to heaven, everything will be wonderful. It says you'll have everlasting life. From the day you got saved, everlasting life and everlasting joy and everlasting love through Jesus Christ. But we think the moment we get saved, oh Lord, I'm saved now. They say, you're going to make my life miserable the rest of my life. Time's gotten harder. Time's gotten tougher because I've accepted Jesus Christ. Now all my old buddies don't want to be my buddies anymore because I've, got, I've accepted Jesus Christ. And people lose their hope and they're discouraged about being a Christian so many times. You know, a lot of young people grew up in church and the minute they got to 19, 20, 21, they said, the minute I get out from under mom and daddy, I ain't never going away to that place. And they quit going to church. And they get out into this world and they store up all their fun and their hope and their everything in this world. And then all of a sudden, guess what? They hit rock bottom. And they come stumbling back into church. And then all of a sudden, God gets them all to their lives. It's like the old prodigal son. And they said, Lord, I'm all so sorry. I've been gone so long. But you see, they, they've lost all hope in the things of this world. And they want to get back to the hope of Jesus Christ. Everybody look with me in Romans 15 as we close this one. Romans 15 verse 3. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope filled you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. This morning, I don't know where you are. I don't know where your life's at. I don't know if you're on top of the world, you're happy. Or if you're in the gully, you're sad. I don't know if your co-worker is miserable. If your family members are miserable because they've lost all hope. And they think it's over. They think it's finished. And they just want to throw in the towel. 
But I want you to know there's hope in Jesus Christ. No matter if you've spent all your money looking for <laughs> happiness, no matter if you've searched all over for the most educated people, there's hope in Jesus Christ. If the doctors told you you have a sickness, you have something they've never seen before, and they can't touch, they can't do nothing for you, they can just give you some pain pills to, to ease the pain. There's hope in Jesus Christ this morning. He can heal you. He can touch you. He has the power to change your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This morning, this morning if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and save your soul, if you don't know without a shadow of a doubt if today was your last day on earth, heaven would be your home. I want you to pray a prayer with me this morning. Lord, I realize I am a sinner. And Lord, I believe in You. Lord, I believe You came to this earth and You died on that cross. Lord, I'm asking and I'm praying that You would forgive me of my sins and save my soul. And nobody looking around this morning, if you prayed that prayer, would you lift your hand? Anybody here? Amen. This morning, you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in defeat. There's hope in a name. Jesus. We don't have to feel like it's over. It's finished. We can put all our faith and our strength in that name. morning, I want you to believe just like Abraham, being fully persuaded that no matter what anybody has ever said to you, no matter how bad the situation is, as long as there's a God in heaven, there's hope. And don't ever give up. we got to believe in Him. No matter what. This morning, if you've been struggling with that kind of Find Jesus. Reach out to Him. Just like that lady did. She had tried everything. Reach out to Jesus. This if you know a family member that's struggling. If you know someone that, is, that has got an addiction or a problem. And they've been struggling. Plant that seed. Just like the brother did. Plant that seed and let them know. God loves you. He died for you. And He wants you to live a happy, better life. This morning as we open this altar, if you know anyone, if you're struggling, <laughs> restore your hope. Everybody standing in this altar.